So our challenge, given a network, find the best path from source to destination, from one node to another in the network. And we define the terminology. We have links. We have paths made up of a set of links. Links are assigned costs. So the numbers in this example indicate some cost of using the link, where we want to use the path which has the least cost, where the path cost is the sum of the link costs on that path. So we had an example. We had two paths from node 1 to node 6, where if we want to go from node 1 to node 6, we said if we care about the number of hops, a hop is to traverse one link, to, to hop across one link. The number of hops to node 1 to node 6, the least hop path, or the least cost path, if we consider cost as the number of hops, is 1, 3, 6. There are two hops on that path. The other hops take three or more paths. The other paths take three or more hops. But if we consider the numbers on the links to be the, the cost that we care about, then the least cost path from N1 to N6 is 1456. Has a cost, path cost of four units. Whereas the other path had a cost of 10 units. So choose the path with the lowest cost. Easy. How do we do that when we have a large network? Dijkstra algorithm, Bellman, Ford and other algorithms can calculate that for us. We don't sit there and look at it and try and find the path. There are algorithms that will do that reasonably efficiently. In, in this course we can do it on small networks, but in practice a computer would do it for us. So the, given that we have a way to calculate the least cost path, then the challenges are how do we know about the network topology? Let's say you are node 1. You're the, the computer for node 1. You want to calculate the least cost path to node 6. To do that, you need to know this topology. You need to know that you have links to node 2 and node 4, and the costs are 1 and 2. And you need to know that node 4 has links to 5 and 6 and so on. So you need to have a picture of that network topology to calculate the least cost path. Learning that information is what we'll look at. How, what are the approaches for learning about that information? And one of the problems with that is that once you learn that the topology is as it is, then over time that may change. Especially the costs of the links may change over time. So if the cost changes, I'm currently using the path 1, 4, 5, 6 to get to 6 because it's the least cost path. But all of a sudden, the, the link from node 4 to node 5 has some problems. Maybe the, the, the performance goes down. So the cost of that link goes up to maybe 10. So now the path I'm using, 1, 4, 5, 6, has a path cost of 13. It's no longer the, the optimal path. So as the conditions change in the network, we would need to recalculate the least cost paths. And that's the challenge with routing. Finding the information about the network and then keeping that information up to date. So let's look at that. Some of the things that we need to be able to do, uh, and the uh, questions are here and some of the possible answers are here. So let's talk about some of them. Uh, first about the cost, listed here is the performance criteria. The number that I put on that line, on those links, what does it represent? Well, it's, it's up to the network operator or the network designer to choose what do they care about in terms of the cost. And there are different metrics or criteria some uh, uh, can be more accurate in terms of indicating if it's the best path. Some are simple. The simpler one is the number of hops. A simple way to calculate or, or to consider the cost is to say, choose the path with the fewest number of hops. That often approximates the best path if we think about performance. Generally, the more hops we have, 
Maybe the more delay we'll have to get from source to destination and maybe the more chance we'll have lower throughput. So a simple way to, to measure cost is the hops. But sometimes that's not accurate to indicate what is the best path to get my data from A to B. So there may be other factors that we take into account, a couple listed here. Financial costs. If you think of a network connecting across the world and connecting different telecom companies or internet service providers across the world, then how it generally works in the internet is that one company maybe owns their, their network in their country or in their city and then they have a, a con contract with another company to send their data to a, through another country. For example, in Thailand, an ISP like uh, TOT or CAT owns the network inside the country, but when they, the customers of that ISP want to send data to the US, then that data needs to go through other people's networks. So TOT or CAT need to have a commercial agreement with other companies to send data via their networks. So sending data via other people's networks incurs some cost, some financial cost here. So generally, the, if we want to deliver our data via other people's networks, we would like to choose the path which has the lowest financial cost. We don't pay as much. So financial cost is one way to, to, to consider the least or the best path. Other times we care about performance. I want to get data from A to B. I want to get there as, there as fast as possible, so delay is another metric. Choose the path with the smallest delay from A to B. Or I've got a lot of data to transfer. So it's not about getting one packet from A to B. It's about I've got a, a stream of data to transfer, so I care about throughput. Choose the path that gives me the highest throughput from A to B. So there are some examples of how we can determine the general cost of a link. And it's up to the operator or the user to, to choose those. There are others as well. One of them may be in large networks, choose a path where my data will not go through a country that I don't like. Okay. I don't like because maybe there are uh, laws in my country saying I cannot send my confidential information through another country. So we may have routing based upon other policies, security policies, uh, legal policies that say data should not go through this, this location. So there are different criteria there. Let's look at delay and throughput as a, as a simple example. Let's consider a very simple network. Where we have five nodes. Node one We have two paths to get the destination node 4. One path takes it via 2 and 3. And another path takes us via node 5. And we focus on one direction from uh, getting data from 1 to 4, just to keep it short and simple. These are our two possible paths to get data from 1 to 4. So at, consider we're at node 1 and we know this network topology. We want to choose one of two paths to get data from to node 4. And let's say we know something about the network links. I know that the, uh, the throughput of the links, let's say this is 
five megabits per second. So the throughput or the data rate, I'll measure in megabits per second. I will not write it. So five megabits per second for this link. For this link, it's three. This link, let's set it to eight. And these two links are two and two. So we know those characteristics of the network. And also we know the delay. Let's assume we know the time it takes to get the, uh, say, a packet across each of those links. The delay, let's say, we measure in milliseconds. So we know that this link has a delay of six milliseconds. Uh, this one, six. One hundred. This one's ten and twelve here. So let's say I know from, I'm node one. I know the network topology. I know that there are four other nodes and the links between them. And I know the current performance characteristics of those links. That is the data rate or throughput, the, the speed at which I can send data, and the delay to send, say, one packet across those links, which the delay includes, of course, takes into account the, the data rate, but also the, the length of the, the link, maybe propagation delay and other processing delays. So. I want to choose the best path to node 4. Well, it depends upon what I define as the, the criteria for best. If I say best is equivalent to lowest delay, then what I do is I assign cost to those links. So the numbers I've written are not the cost yet, they're just the performance characteristics. I assign a number to each link which uh, we can then use to calculate the least cost path. With delay it's easy. If I know the delay, the path delay is a summation of the link delays and the best path is the one with the lowest delay. So in fact we can say delay is proportional to cost in this case. So what I could say if the delay of link 1 to 5 is 10 milliseconds, then let's say the cost of using that link is 10. Not the financial cost, but some general cost independent of the, the metric. So the cost can be equivalent to delay in this case. So the general cost in this case, we can say, is the same as the delay So the cost of link 1 to 5 would be 10. 5 to 4 would be 12. That's easy. They're the same numbers. And then what's the best path? 154. The total path cost, if I use 154, is 22 units. If I go 1, 2, 3, 4, it's 112 units. Okay. So if I consider delay, I choose the path 154. If I used a different metric, so we'll just record that, that would give us the path. The best path is 154 in that case. If I use number of hops, then it would also be 154 because number of hops uh, may be another metric. If the best path was something different is the number of hops, we defined a different metric, lowest number of hops, then what's the cost that we assign to each link? If we want a different metric and say, choose the path which is the lowest number of hops from source to destination, 
we need to assign a number to each link to indicate the general cost. What would it be for each link? What would I assign the link 1 to 5? What's the cost of this link? 1. It's one hop. So in fact every link would have the cost of 1 in that case. That's a, maybe the simplest of cases. So the cost from 1 to 5 is 1, from 5 to 4 is 1, it's one hop. So again we could calculate the least cost path. We could use the same algorithm and we'd find it's 1, 5, 4. So this is just illustrating we use different costs depending upon the criteria we care about. Now let's consider throughput. Let's say we, we care about a path, I've got a lot of data to send, for continuously I want to send data. So I care about what's the highest throughput I can achieve across that path. I would say the best is the highest throughput or data rate. What do we assign as a cost on each link if we care about choosing the path with the highest throughput? Maybe look at the network and see which, which path, there's only two to choose from, is the best in your perspective. So now I say I will define best as the highest throughput. And given that, I need to assign some cost to each link. The cost should be related to the throughput. And the cost should be such that if we use least cost routing, find the path with least cost, it will give us the best path. So what cost do we assign to our links now? First, looking at the blue numbers, which are the throughput measures, which path do you think is best? The top one or the bottom one? Hands up for the top one. Hands up for the bottom one. And we get uh, some for the most for the top, some for the bottom. Why do you think the top one's the best? Looking at the blue numbers, which are the throughput. We get a throughput from 1 to 2 of 5 megabits per second, from 2 to 3 of 3, and 3 to 4 of 8. Whereas on the bottom path, 2 and 2. Well, throughput's a bit, bit harder than delay to consider. Across a path, the throughput of that path will be limited by the slowest throughput across that path, what we call the bottleneck link. That is, the path from 154 we can send at 2 megabits per second continuously to 5 and that can send at 2 on to 4 so we can get 2 all the way from 1 to 4. That's easy. Going from 1, 2, 3, 4 we can send at 5 to 2 but from 2 to 3 we can only send at 3 megabits per second. So if we send at 5 through to 2 and 3 to 3 then somewhere that remaining 2 megabits per second is going to be lost. It's not going to get through. That is, if we send 5 into 2 and 3 out, the amount that we're going to deliver to the end is limited by 3. We cannot do more than that. And even if we send 3, in, three megabits per second into node 3, and that can send 8 out, on average, getting data from node 2 to node 4 is going to be limited at 3 megabits per second. So in fact, across a path, the path throughput is limited by the bottleneck link. The bottleneck link is the slowest link. In this case, we say this is the bottleneck link. In the, in the top path. So we can say that the path throughput would be 3 in the top path and it would be 2 in the bottom path. Which one's better? Top or bottom? 
The top one's better. Higher throughput is better. So be careful. Delay and throughput. We want low delay, but we want high throughput. So now, what cost do we assign to each link? We need to assign some numbers to the links such that our least cost routing will choose in this case, it should choose the top path. Well, the, the first approach we can think is think of the inverse. That is, if we want, if we have a high throughput, the cost should be low. All right, so if the, the throughput is five, then the cost should be, uh, and, and the second link, the throughput is two, for a throughput of five, the cost should be lower than a throughput of two. So we can think we need to do some inverse. One divided by five may be the cost. And one divided by two, the cost on this link. And then, again, least cost routing always simply finds the path where the sum of the costs is the least. So here we have a bit of a challenge. What do we assign as the cost of those links? Just taking the inverse is usually not sufficient. The general approach to use is to consider, of all your links in the network, what's the maximum? And then take that maximum and divide it by the actual throughput. Or take some potential maximum and divide it by the actual. I'll show you an example of that. Let's say potentially the throughput can go up to 100 megabits per second, just to make a nice number. So what we could say, if we think the throughput goes up to 100, then this link, we would set the cost to be 100 divided by 5. 20. This link would be 100 divided by 3. 33, approximately. This link, 100 divided by 8. Where this 100 we would choose as a, as a parameter and say, right, that's our, our upper limit. And we'll see how it works. That's about 12. This would be 100 divided by 2, 50. And 100 divided by 2 as well. So we'd assign these costs to the links, 20, 33, 12, 50, and 50. Now, let's just do a, a sanity check. The higher throughput should give us a lower cost. Yes, 5 gives us 20, 2 gives us 50. Okay, so we've got the inverse there. That's working. And now, the reason for taking this maximum, when we add them up, what do we get? The top path, 20 plus 33 plus 12, is, what, 65. The path cost is 65 units. The bottom path, 50 plus 50, gives us 100 units. Least cost path is the top one. 65 is less than 100, therefore we'd choose that path. So that's the, usually the way that it's done in practice if we have throughput or data rate. First, we need the inverse. To determine the cost, it should be the inverse of the actual throughput or data rate. And to make the numbers such that we, when we add them up, we'll get the, the best path. It doesn't work all the ways, but in most cases we can select some number such that uh, when we add them up, the one with the lowest sum will indicate the one with the, the best throughput. And the common is to choose some, some upper limit in a network, say 100 megabits per second, or, or it can be higher or a different value depending upon the network. It doesn't always work because there may be cases where uh, the bottleneck is, uh, is in the wrong path, is in the path that we select. Uh, the, the lowest throughput on the path doesn't correspond to the lowest sum. But in practice, in most cases, it will, uh, is a way to convert throughput into a generic cost where we can still use least cost routing. Yep. 
100 was, in this example, was a value I chose, and the idea where it comes from is think in our network, well, uh, what's the highest throughput that we can get on any link? Well, in this particular example, it's 8. If we used 8, what would we have had? The numbers may not have been easy. It would have been 8 divided by 5, 1.3 or whatever, 8 divided by 3, 2 point something, 8 divided by 8, 1, 8 divided by 2 is 4, 8 divided by 2 is 4. This path would have been 8, 4 plus 4. This would have been the 1 plus 2 plus 1 would have been least. It would have worked if we use 8 as well. So it should be at least the maximum of or the yeah, the maximum of all the link data rates or throughputs. I chose one hundred because it makes nice numbers when I divide by, okay, rather than having decimals we can get uh, close to integers. It's a little bit easier to, to work with. So that comes from the maximum. See if you can find a case where it doesn't work. You may be able to find a, a scenario where using this approach with particular link rates, the least cost path chosen will be the one with which is not giving the highest throughput. So it doesn't always work, but most cases it will. So converting the metric to cost is not easy. With delay it was easy, They're proportionally related. With hops it was easy. With throughput, it was a little bit harder. What did we do? We said uh, some maximum value divided by the actual value. The maximum throughput of all the links divided by the actual throughput. And the actual needs to be down the bottom so that it's the inverse. And we use the maximum to give numbers such that will get the least cost path most cases. If we want to deal with other performance metrics, then we need to consider other ways to convert them to a cost, to a number, such that we can still use least cost routing. Any questions on the costs? or performance criteria for selecting the best path. Of course, for this to work, node one needed to know about the costs, uh, needed to know about the performance metric. It needed to know that the link from two to three had a throughput of three megabits per second and a delay of six milliseconds. If it didn't know that, this approach wouldn't work. Let's look at the other problems and we'll arrive at how do we learn that information. That's about performance criteria. There are different ones that we can choose from. And it would be defined for a particular network which one to use. When do you choose a route? When do you make the decision to use this particular route? And there are again different approaches and two common ones with datagram packet switching for every packet you choose a route. Okay, or well you make the decision to use a particular route. That is that as one of the nodes has a packet to send and it looks and chooses which route to send it on. It doesn't necessarily recalculate the best paths but it chooses a route for that packet. The next packet it chooses again and it may get a different path. And we saw that when we looked at datagram packet switching versus virtual circuit packet switching. With virtual circuit packet switching, we first set up a connection, sometimes called a session. So when I set up that connection, I choose the path to use. And for all of the packets during that session, during that data transfer, they take the same path. So there, the decision time is done when we set up the session. And it applies to all the packets. With datagram packet switching, the normally we make a decision for each packet separately. So they're the two common approaches there. 
The result is with datagram packet switching, packets may take different paths through the network. With virtual circuit packet switching, packets belonging to that one virtual circuit or session will take the same path. Who makes the decision and who calculates the best paths? Three basic approaches. Each node does it themselves. Each node calculates the path and, and makes a decision. I have a packet, look at the destination of that packet and make a decision where to send that. So that's a distributed approach. Each, each node makes the decision and the calculation. A centralised approach is we have some special node in the network, maybe some special server that calculates the paths and decides for all the other nodes. And the third approach is that the source node, the one that's creating the data, makes the decision. And that's called source routing. In practice in the internet or large networks, the distributed approach is most commonly used. The nodes themselves will calculate what they think are the best paths to reach some destination. And when they have a packet, they will use that best path. The problem with a distributed approach is that some nodes may have different viewpoints of the network. Node 1 may think the best path to node 6 is via this direction. Node 5 may think it's via a different direction because they maybe uh, have different information about the network. So in a distributed system, there's a problem with coordinating those nodes. So we'll see an example of that as we go through the next two. So the next two are, how does a node know the current network topology and how do we keep that information up to date? So let's look at, at several cases of how to do that and we'll use an example to do that. Let's consider another network. Let's say we are node 1 in our network. I'm node 1 and I want to send data to some other nodes and in this case I know that there's another node in the network called node 7. I want to send to node 7. I know there is a node 7 in the network. Here's node 7. So I have data to send to node 7. And I know there are some paths to node 7. Hopefully there are. We are node 1. I have my packet to send to node 7. Where do I send it? Where does node 1 send the packet? Well, or how does it calculate the best path to node 7? What is the best path to node 7? What is it? No idea. We don't know yet because why don't we know? We, we don't know about the other nodes in the network or, or any of the links. So let's say my, I am node 1 and I just booted the computer. I just started the device. So when it boots up, that's the knowledge that node 1 has about the network. It knows nothing about the entire network. So if I want to send to node 7 and I know nothing about the network, can I do that? Can I send to node 7 without knowing anything about the network? Yes, how? Send to everyone. All right, so I create a packet, I say the destination address is 7, and send to everyone. All right, well, everyone, when my device boots up, someone plugs in the cables, and when they plug in the cables, then I know that if there's three cables plugged in, what I would do is I'd send a copy of that one packet on all three links, all three cables. Someone will receive it, I don't care who gets it, and then I'll tell them, when you get this packet, send to all of your neighbours. 
and then they will send to all of their neighbours, and eventually it will get to node 7 if there is a path to node 7. So that's an, an approach which is very simple. Even if we know nothing about the network, we can still get data to node 7. And it turns out a packet will take the best path through the network to get to node 7. That is the next technique we'll look at. Not yet. This is called flooding. We'll come back to that technique of flooding. We'd like a better approach. That is, we want to take just one path. Let's be a little bit smarter. So the first thing we can do is let's, when I boot up, so we can make routing decisions with no knowledge of the network, knowing nothing about the network. But let's boot up and let's say when I boot my computer and the links start, all right, their cables plugged in, then I can learn about my neighbours. I can learn who's at the other endpoint of the links. So when my computer starts up, it it connects to some other device at the other end of the, point, out of the link and finds its address. So let's say we have some neighbours. And in this case we have two neighbours. Node and we learn the addresses, node 2 and node 5. So that's commonly assumed that a node can easily learn about its neighbours. So it knows uh, I'm connected to 2 and 5. I'm not connected to 7. All right, I learned that. I still want to get my data to 7. What's the best path to take to get to 7? Let's say we don't want to take this approach of sending to everyone because that's really a waste. Which path do I take to get to 7? Do I send a 2 or 5? Again, we don't really know which one to send to. We could choose randomly. All right. Today I'm going to use node 2. Tomorrow let's try node 5. And hope our data gets there across the best path, but most time, or many times it will not. So that's not so good. So we need to know something about the potential paths so after we've booted up, we learn about 2 and 5. And the other thing that we can often learn is what is the cost of each path, of each link. Let's say the costs we know are, are 3 and 2. Maybe the costs are measuring delay. And again, it's quite easy for a node to know that the cost of its current link is some value. It doesn't take much to learn that information. And it doesn't take much to, to uh, keep up to date about that information. That is, this cost changes. Something goes wrong or the, 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 uh, the delay goes up for some reason, so the cost goes from 2 to 3. Again, node 1 will know that almost immediately. So we know about our local or our neighbours and the links to those neighbours. So now, which path do I choose? I want to send to node 7. Where are you going to choose? You choose 5. Why 5? So node 5 has a lower cost on that link. So if this is all we know, we could choose to send to node 5. And remember, node 5 would also know about its neighbours. We, as node 1, don't know its neighbours, not yet at least. But node 5 knows its neighbours and it could do the same thing. I choose node 5 because of my two neighbours, it has the lowest cost. Node 5 gets the packet and then choose from its neighbours, the one with the lowest cost, and then they choose the lowest cost and hopefully the data gets to 7. But it may not be the lowest cost path, that's the problem. So what else can we do? I want to be more certain that the path I take is the lowest cost path. What can I do? Ask, ask who? Ask two and three, uh, uh, two and five. Ask my neighbours, who are their neighbours? And what are the costs of the links to those neighbours? So this involves some overhead. 
So what I do, a routing protocol, what it will do is send a message from node 1 to 5 saying, who are your neighbours? Please tell me your neighbours. And node 5 would send back a message saying, my neighbours are these nodes and these are the cost of the links. So this is some overhead of, of collecting this information. So let's say we do that and we do learn the neighbours. Node 2 has two neighbours, 6 and 4. So we've sent a message to node 2. Node 2 sends back a message saying my neighbours are 6 and 4 and they also tell me the cost of those links. The cost from 2 to 6 is 8 and the cost from 2 to 4 is 2. And I do the same thing for node 5. My other neighbour, I send a message and he sends back a message saying my neighbour is 3. cost of the link from 5 to 3 in this case node 5 tells us node 1 it's 5 so by exchanging messages with other nodes we can learn more about the network topology and that may help us finding the best path from node 1 to node 7 now node 1 needs to choose which path before someone chose 5 Someone said five. Any other alternatives now? Maybe going via node four looks like a potential good path. It has a cost of five units. So the decision you made before is maybe wrong. Or maybe you're lucky, we'll see. But you see, the more information we learn, the more chance we have of choosing the best path. Now. Again, the link costs may change over time. So in a large network, the cost may change. So if the link cost from 2 to 4 changes, it increases up to 10, then how does node 1 know it changes? All right, so I know it's 2 now because I sent a message to 2 and they sent back my link cost to 4 is 2. So now I look like I'm going to use that path. But the cost changes from 2 up to 10. And we'll see that that's probably not the best path now. So for node 1 to get an accurate record of the current network, not only does it have to discover, but it has to continuously get updates. I have to continually see, send a message to my neighbours saying, tell me your neighbours and the cost of the links to those neighbours. Do it again and again and again. So there's more overhead here. If the network changes a lot, we will need to continually get updates to get an accurate record. We still don't have the best path, or not necessarily the best path to seven. So the next step is not only do I tell, ask my neighbours, but I ask my neighbours about their neighbours, and I learnt this. In the same time, all the other nodes are doing that. Node 5 asks its neighbours, 1 and 3, about their neighbours. And when Node 5 asks 3 about its neighbours, Node 3 sends back a response to 5. And the next time I, Node 1, ask Node 5, Node 5 not just tells me about its direct neighbours, but about its neighbours' neighbours. Okay, so each node keeps up to date of what they know about the network. For example, when node 5 asks node 3, node 3 sends back a response saying my neighbours are 4, 6 and 7.
they are the neighbours of three. And so when five sent a message to three, three sent back a response saying, my neighbours are four, six and seven. And the costs of those links are one, four and seven. So five knows this. The next time node one sends a message to node five, five tells node one about its neighbours, but also the other information it knows. Five knows that the neighbours of three are four, six and seven, so five tells one that. So now one knows the neighbours of three are four, six and seven. Similar, the other nodes. Node four has neighbours. So when we ask node 2, node 2 tells us about 4's neighbours and 6's neighbours. And these are the links in our network and the costs. So when two sends a response back to one, it says, my neighbours are four and six, and they have told me in the past that their neighbours are the ones connected via these links. So now, this is the view of the entire network from node one's perspective. And in this example, that is the entire network. There are no more links. We would keep going if the network was larger. Importantly, for node one to discover about the network topology and the costs of the links, it needs to ask other nodes. It needs to send packets, special routing packets to other nodes saying, tell me about your links. And because the network topology may change over time, links may disappear, new links may come up, costs may change. We need to regularly do this. We can't just do it once and hope that that gives us the best information. And that's the challenge of routing. Try to do that by minimising the overhead. Don't, we don't want to send too many packets to do this, but we want to get an up-to-date view of the, the network. Once node one knows this information, it simply uses Dijkstra's algorithm or whatever to calculate the path to node seven. And we find, which is it? Anyone can see the path to node seven? Least cost path? Can anyone get a cost less than, what, 12? Anyone get a cost from node 7 less than 12? One, five, three, someone said at the start, send via five, that's not so good, because even though it's two to five, another five, that's seven, but then seven here. Maybe we could go here, it doesn't help much. 1 to 2 is 3, to 4 is 5, to 3 is 6, to 6 is 10, to 7 is 12. So here the least cost path is actually one of the longer paths. So the more information we know, the greater the chance we will choose the best path. But the more information we know, the more overhead in collecting that. That's the trade-off here. And some of those issues are summarised in these points. So let's just recap. So the, the two issues are, where do we get the information from about the network topology? And how often do we update that information? And some of the alternatives are listed here. Well, we said, where do we get the information from? At the very start, let's say we know nothing about the network. Can we do routing? We know we have none, no information. Well, yes, we can do routing, but it may not be very good. We said there's an approach called flooding, which we'll return to later. So send to everyone. Local means use the information on your node. When on my device boots up, it knows something about itself. So it can use local information with very little overhead. Adjacent nodes is really just a neighbor nodes. 
So we saw if we talk to our neighbours and we know the links to the neighbours, we can make a decision on routing based upon their information. Or we could extend that and say the neighbours' neighbours, the neighbours' neighbours' neighbours and so on. Eventually we could ask all the nodes in the network. And if we know about all the nodes, then we know everything about the network. So the more information we collect, the more accurate we are in choosing the best path. The other aspect is we need to continuously, or we, we'd like to update that information. Sometimes we can get a continuous update. Node 1 always knows about the cost to Node 5 because it's actually directly connected to that link, so it knows that. So we've got a continuous update. If this changes to 3, we know immediately. But if this cost changes from 5 to 6, the only way we know is by asking our neighbour or our neighbour telling us. So we can have continuous updates or we can do it periodically. Every one minute I send a message to my neighbours, please tell me about the latest cost of your links. Do it on a periodic basis. Or maybe when there's a major change in the network. Instead of waiting on a periodic basis, when node 5 realises the link to 3 goes up to a different value, maybe it changes to 10 here, a major increase in the cost, then node 5 tells its neighbours, the link which I passed told you was 5 has now gone up to 10. You may want to change the paths. So a major change. Or node 3 disappears, a major change in the topology. If node 3 disappears, node 5 should tell node 1, 3 is no longer there. Update your view of the network. So there are different ways or different places to collect information from and different ways to update that information. And now the challenges with routing in general get up-to-date information, but minimise the overhead of doing so. Any questions so far? We've covered the basics of routing. Learn the information about the network, then apply some algorithm to calculate the least cost routes. Not so hard. The next thing we'll look at is how do we store this information? That is, node 1 finds the least cost paths and it will try to find not just to node 7 but generally we'd like to find the least cost path to all potential nodes. So when I have data to send, I don't then go and find the path. I, when I have data to send, if I know the path already, I'll just send the data. That's a common technique. Let's return to, not, uh, to our original example that you have in your notes. And we'll look at the case of how can we store the information. So now what we'd like to do is to we'll separate the, the process of finding the routes from the process of sending data. Sending data, we need to know the route to send it via. Calculating the routes is a separate process and that's what's common in networks today and the internet is that the process of finding the route, called routing, is done independently in the background the process of sending the data along the route, called forwarding, is done whenever we have data to send. So let's focus on the process of routing and, and how do we store the information of the, the routes. So let's, in this example network, first, how many routes are there? In the entire network, how many possible routes do we need, least cost routes are there in this network? 
How many least cost routes are there? Let's say I have a server that needs to store all of the routes, all the possible routes in the network, the paths. How many are there that I need to store? You can try and calculate them all, or there may be an easier way. Node 1 would need a least cost route to every other node. All right, there are five other nodes, so there's five. Node 2 needs a least cost route or path to every other node. There's another five paths. Note that the path from node 1 to node 2 may be a different path than from node 2 to node 1 because our links are asymmetric. We have different costs of the links. If they were the same cost, then we'd have uh, the same path in both directions. So if node 1 should have five least cost paths. Node 2 needs another five least cost paths and each node needs five least cost paths. So in this network there are 30 paths in total. So there are two, two main approaches for calculating them or, or for storing them. One is that we have a central server that calculates this, maybe computer 7 looks at the network, learns the topology and then calculates and, st and then tells every node about those paths. More commonly today is that the nodes do that independently. Node 1 goes around, goes away and calculates its path to the other five. Node 2 does it and each node does that and we'll consider that case. So let's record some of them. For node 1, calculate all the least cost paths from node 1 to every destination. So the source node is node 1. I want you to find the paths to all the other potential destinations, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Let's record the, that information, the path, the least cost path we're talking about here. We'll talk about also the cost of that path. Let's record that. What's the least cost path from node 1 to node 2? Well, from node 1 direct to node 2, the cost is 2. Can anyone see a path less than 2? No, there's no path less than 2 to node 2. So we say node 1 to node 2, the path is 1 and 2. And the cost is 2. To node 3, least cost path to node 3. Not so hard. Look through some of them, you'll quickly find the path. and then do it for the other nodes. From node 3 to node, at uh, node 1 to node 3, 1, 2, 3 has a cost of 5, that's not good. What about 1, 4, 5, 3 has a cost of 3? So be careful there. 1, 4, 5, 3. Has a cost of 3 units. Node 1 to node 4. Least cost path. And here you can, of course, you can see it on the picture, but 
one shortcut, if the least cost path from node 1 to node 3 goes via 4, then it means the least cost path to node 4 from node 1 must be this segment of the path. That is, from node 1 to node 4, the least cost path is 1 direct to 4. If there was a lower cost path from 1 to 4, then that means there would be a lower cost path from 1 to 3. For example, and it's not in the network, if there was a path 1, 8, 4, which had a lower cost than 1 direct to 4, if there was, that means there would be a path from 1 to 3, 1, 8, 4, 5, 3, with a lower cost than 3. But since we already know this is the least cost path, then it must be that the least cost path from 1 to 4 is 1 direct to 4. And that's an important thing that we can take advantage of. The path cost, if we look at the network, it's 3 in that case. And similar here. We know that to go to 3, we go via 5. That means that a, there is a least cost path 1, 4, 5. And you can check the cost is 2 there. And 1, 4, 5, 6 we've seen before. The cost there was 3, is it, or 4? Just record the costs here as well, the path costs. So what node 1 does is it learns the network topology, it calculates the five least cost paths to each destination and stores this information. Now when I have a data packet to send, it's very simple. I have a data packet to send. If the destination is node 3, I can look up. OK, the path to node 3 goes via node 4 and 5. Send the packet to node 4. If the destination is node 5, then also send to node 4. So the way that we use this information is now that when we have data to send, just do a look up to see who to send it to next. And by this concept that we said that if a least cost path from 1 to 3 goes via 4, then it implies that there's a least cost path from 1 to 4. Similar, if there's a least cost path from 1 to 3 that goes via 4, there is a least cost path from 4 to 3, which is 4, 5, 3. If 1, 4, 5, 3 is a least cost path, then it means the segments in that path are also least cost paths. 4, 5, 3 must be a least cost path. From node 4's perspective, when it calculates the least cost paths, it will say from 4 to 3, it will find the path 4, 5, 3. You can check that. But the point is, because of that, node 1 doesn't care in fact, about the entire path. Once it calculates the least cost path, it only needs to know the next node in the path. What node 1 will do, it knows to reach 3, we need to send to the next node 4. It will send the packet to node 4. Node 4 will have its least cost paths, and to reach node 3 from node 4, the least cost path will be 4, 5, 3 and node 4 will know to send it node 5. Node 5 will have its least cost path and will send it to 3. The end result, once we calculate the least cost paths, we only need to store the next node in the path. So we don't need to store the entire path. So from node 1 to node 2, the next, to next node is node 2. Here it's node 4, node 4. Yeah. 
So even though we can calculate the path, there's no need to store that. And that makes it simpler for the nodes when we have long or large networks. And there's no need to update anything about the, the other paths. It makes it simpler for the nodes to uh, recalculate the, the best paths. So the key information that node 1 stores, for each destination, what is the next node in the least cost path to reach that destination? And every node does that. We optionally also store the cost. That will be used later. And that information is what we call a routing table. It's a table that we store information about the routes or least cost paths in. We call it a routing table. And to finish, you may have a look. The routing table, here's what we've arrived at. Every node in a distributed approach stores for each potential destination, node 1, node 2, node 3, what is the next node in the least cost path, and usually optionally the, the cost of that path. We don't store the path, we just store the next node because of this concept of the, the segments in a least cost path are also least cost paths. And the routing table for node 1, here it's listed as a routing directory, but I will usually call a routing table, is this table. To reach destination 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, the corresponding net next nodes are 2, 4, 4, 4, 4. That is this column and the next node column. That's our routing table. So we'll spend some time uh, arriving at routing tables. How we can see how to create a routing table and then they become very important in the internet because we use routing tables to know where to send our data in the internet. So we'll stop there. We'll look next lecture at some extensions of the routing tables, uh, some other examples, and then look at return to flooding and see that basic approach, send to everyone to do routing and compare the different routing strategies.